Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. That was a fantastic way to kick off the day. Thanks, Louise. So today I'm going to be focusing on a concept that we call data trust, and I'm going to be focusing on data trust in the context of the future of open banking. And I'm, I'm very much hopeful. In fact, I place some trust in the fact that it will build upon Louise's presentation. Super quickly about me, I've been obsessing uh, for the last seven or eight years about the inner workings of the information economy, the inherent power imbalances, information asymmetry, the material and immaterial harms that are resulting from things like advanced analytics, and supporting organizations all around the world in designing verifiably trustworthy information sharing ecosystems. If you want to connect with me, uh, Tweet at Nathan Kinch if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. Please feel free to do so. I, I'm hopeful that uh, this conversation is uh, something that continues far beyond today. I'm going to break the presentation down into three distinct segments. Segment one is going to focus on work that we've recently done that proposes a vision that we believe is rather compelling, strategy, tactics and measures of progress for the consumer data right regime here in Australia. We want to optimize for the CDR's purpose to empower individuals with meaningful control over how they participate in the digital economy in such a way that we foster innovation and competition. Part two is going to focus on a little bit more practical stuff, our data trust by design work and recent research that we've conducted with the data standards body here in Australia. And lastly, we're going to end with something that's reasonably practical, and we're going to ask some questions, and we're going to engage in a very simple three-question poll. All right, kick off. Oh, shit, there's that word, trust again. Let me just touch on this really quickly. So no one's defined what trust is, as in by definition. Now, there are so many definitions out there. I quite like Rachel Botsman's definition. Trust is high confidence in the unknown. But is high confidence in the unknown the thing that we should be optimizing for? At Greater Than X, we actually argue that verifiable trust, as in an independent, well-evidenced, cryptographically and otherwise demonstration that an organization is transparent in communicating its intent, consistently delivering the value that it promises, and truly willing to own the consequences, both positive and negative, of their actions. We might come back to some of that later. Trust is at an all-time low. We've seen that all over the place. The Edelman Trust Barometer here in Australia, the Roy Morgan Net Trust Survey, lots of different resources that propose this. What's rather interesting, though, is this new research that intends to quantify and does it reasonably well, showcasing that trust has a disproportionate impact on bottom-line business outcomes, specifically growth, agility, and net income. Sounds pretty attractive, right? The relationship between data trust, uh, or, or data sharing and trust, excuse me, it's becoming much clearer. And at the moment, many individuals actively distrust the organizations that they're sharing data with. I touched on this a moment ago, but at present, there are a variety of different material and immaterial harms that we are beginning to learn about. Individuals face increasing risk of manipulation, as do states. The relationship between privacy and our mental health is something that organizations like Stanford and, and other academic institutions have been doing some fantastic research on. Uh, I love this one, the, the ineffectiveness of the current model, and by that I mean something very specific, the fact that individuals don't actively participate in information sharing ecosystems, they passively participate, is resulting in billions of uh, lost economic opportunity. And when you bring all of this together, there are a variety, and Louise touched on this, of regulatory, technological, attitudinal, and behavioral forces that are encouraging us to look in the mirror and ask, is this a trajectory that we want to reinforce? And in some recent work, we argue rather assertively that the answer is no. This doesn't mean that there's nothing good going on. There's so many amazing things happening that should give us hope that we can turn things around, that we can make progress towards a more empowering and prosperous future. But 
We think in order to do that, and specifically in the context of the consumer data right, we kind of have to define a highest order value. We have to have an explicit vision for how something like the CDR, how empowering individuals with meaningful control, will change the world that we live in. We believe that technology can augment human capability in such a way that it, it enables us to maximize the amount of time that we spend truly experiencing life's most meaningful moments. We think that's a future worth designing. So the big question is, how do we get there? Is in how do we close the gap between the two states, where we are today and where we'd like to be in the future? Now, in this recent work, and, and I should just note that the PDF you can gain access to via the Curious Thinkers app um, has a bunch of links embedded into it. The report is one of them, uh, our recent research, a variety of different external links. So if you're interested in anything that I say here today and you'd like to dive deeper, the, uh, the interactive or semi-interactive PDF will enable you to do that. So in this recent work, we propose that, uh, and this is a, a great distinction, and, and our team and, um, were sort of talking about this yesterday, um, the, the relationship between collaboration and uh, uh, where, we, where we have to move to in order to sort of get over that collaboration as friction um, uh, viewpoint. If we are to close the gap between these two states, as in where we are today and this vision that we have, and we've set a date for 2030, all of these things are super ambiguous and, 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 uh, and, and, and inherently uncertain, but we believe that a new take on platform ecosystem strategy can help us get there. And there are some specific things that we have to focus on. It has to be participatory. It has to be cooperative. It has to rely on truly leading standards and emergent technologies. And something that the Hain Royal Commission called out in its 76 recommendations was effectively that misconduct was being rewarded. And if you look at what's the root cause of that, it's misaligned incentive structures. We need outcome aligned incentive structures if we're to close the gap between these two states. Again, much more detail on that in the report. So how will we do it? Is in what are the enabling functions? What are the tactical elements of this strategic action plan? This is a non-exhaustive list. We're talking about something that's kind of complex and nuanced here. But these five things we think are really important. Progressive and participatory governance structures, outcome-aligned incentive structures, truly accountable ethics frameworks, like how often do we hear about data ethics, AI ethics, etc. Very few organizations have demonstrated and verified that they've operationalized the principles that they've established and communicated in a blog. We need verifiably trustworthy technology, and we need to deliver simple, effective, and empowering consumer experiences. But importantly, we need to put them to the test. We need to define, design, and iteratively optimize them. We need to build a body of validated learning, qual quant across attitudinal and behavioral dimensions. We want to decrease the risk and inherent uncertainty that's associated with doing this new stuff. Last question before I move on to the next section. How will we know if we're making progress? I've had a lot of discussions over the last 24 hours or so about metrics. And at present, we value what we measure. We think there's an opportunity to step back and actually ask a different question. What is it that we value? How might we go about measuring that qualitatively and quantitatively, evidencing progress toward the outcomes that we value most? And so I'd like you to ask yourself, and this is sort of like requiring you to take off your work hat for a moment if you don't mind, which outcomes matter most to you and your loved ones? Is it the time that you spend with your kids on the weekend? Like being down here in Sydney, you know, you see people exercising and stuff like that around the harbour. Is it that sort of time? Like, what is it? Is it the Netflix and chill with your significant other? You know, like, what is it that you value most? And then I'd like you to think about how your organisation or other organisations might support you in achieving those outcomes and maximizing the time that you spend experiencing those meaningful moments. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our work. Our core thesis at Greater Than X is that the most trustworthy organizations will become the most valued. These organizations will gain access to more of the right data. Gaining access to this data, access to their customers, will enable these very same organizations to deliver valuable, 
meaningful and engaging lifestyle services, these organizations will win their market. And we believe that the future of the information economy, and we think that CDR might be a catalyst for this if we actively design it this way, we think that the future of the digital economy here in Australia can be enabled by safe, effective, and empowering lifestyle services. There's a big challenge standing in our way. In fact, there are many. I'm just calling out one. Today, people passively share their data. A disproportionate amount of the information that's flowing out there in the ether about us, it's not stuff that we've actively submitted via forms, right? The consumer data right and similar information sharing initiatives globally propose that individuals actively share their data. This is a challenge. We're talking about behavior change, right? And this is not just from a consumer standpoint. Organizations need to empower individuals with the tools and protections to share data actively. But change is kind of hard. All of us can empathize with this. Has anyone seen the research on like, New Year's resolutions and how frequently people fail? <laughs> oh, I don't set New Year's resolutions anymore. Um, John T. Gorville's work from 06. And there's a really good article uh, in Harvard Business Review that proposes that uh, individuals, it's called the 9x effect, individuals overvalue what they currently have and organizations overvalue what they're offering the market. There's a mismatch in expectations. Therefore, it's no surprise that so many new initiatives fail. It's actually slightly more complicated than that, though. Over time, millions of years of evolution, our brain has developed heuristics. It takes shortcuts. Why? And I think these four points are rather pertinent to these two days. You know, when we're in a setting like this, it's like, it's overwhelming. It's all these awesome people talking about a variety of different things, super strategic all the way down to pragmatic, tactical stuff. And we've got to like navigate between these two states. Information overload. As a result of information overload, we struggle. We find it hard to derive meaning. But we need to act fast. We're no longer running from lions, but that doesn't mean that life isn't fast-paced, right? And we really struggle to prioritize what we should retain and reuse. Now, the reason that I'm calling this out is because empirically we would argue that information sharing in ecosystems, uh, like at their inception, so often don't consider behavioral sciences and behavioral design methods yet, they assume, perhaps wrongly, that individuals and organizations will shift behavior. By understanding these things, by doing the work, by taking the time to understand these concepts, we may well be able to utilize them to our advantage to drive the positive and proactive change that we envisage. All right, so this is where data trust by design really enters the picture. Data trust by design is a toolkit that enables organizations to systematically deliver trustworthy products and services. And as um, was mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of our work is now being relied upon by the data standards body here in Australia, the OBIE in the UK, and a variety of commercial and non-commercial organizations globally. Data Trust by Design started out as a reasonably heuristic practice before it was a mature toolkit. It's first and foremost principles led, but there's, there's a real problem with principles. There are good things, there are bad things, there are pros and there are cons. Highly interpretable, that might be good, that might be bad, right? Depending on the context. But so often principles aren't systematically executed, they're not operationalized, they're not embedded into daily workflows, practices, behaviors. So we designed our principles in such a way that they represent, rather consciously, the person to organization relationship life cycle. There is a beginning, there is a middle, and there is so often, although we don't like to admit it, admit it an end. So we execute these principles in the context of that person to organization relationship, but that's still very limiting. So 
So although Data Trust by Design is principles-led, it's skills-based and practices enabled. We support the clients that we work with in evolving their research practices, their design practices, and their collaboration or their co cooperation. If they've gotten to that point, they're in self-organizing teams, they have agency, they have autonomy. They have the incentive structures to support cooperation. And what this is enabling us to do is embed data trust by design into the way that organizations work. It's not something that sits external to our daily work. It's part of business as usual. We also support our practices with a series of tools. Our evolving design system is one of them. This enables organizations to deploy simple, effective, and empowering data sharing experiences faster. Very few organizations have explicitly focused, and let's say you're a personal information management service or a self-sovereign identity provider, very few organizations have explicitly spent all of their time focusing on designing simple, effective and empowering data sharing experiences. This enables these organizations to rely on, I'm not going to say best practices, because we don't have best practices in this stuff yet, it's too new, but emerging practices that are tried and tested and empirically validated in such a way that they can do more of what they're already good at and progressively build capability. So again, this becomes embedded into BAU. We also support our design system with a series of canvases. So many of us are used to utilizing canvases uh, the business model canvas, the value proposition canvas, the lean UX canvas, you name it, there's a, there's a canvas for it, right? We had to join the party, we had FOMO. So we've got a bunch of different canvases from better disclosure, and this touches on Louise's point about terms and conditions being fundamentally broken. I'm not going to critically analyze that now, but if you want some content on that, very happy to share it with you. Through to outcome-aligned incentive structures, through to the switching forces, the progress making and the progress hindering forces that encourage or discourage a switch from one behavior to another. And these enable organizations, teams, individuals to immerse themselves in this type of work because they're literally there on the walls. Like printing these out AO, Rob, I'm looking at you, I know that, I know that you can uh, relate to this, uh, really makes a difference. We've built upon our work to develop a variety of different design patterns. And design patterns take reusable components and atomic symbols and put them together to support a particular outcome. We apply these design patterns to upfront consent, just in time consent, consent management and revocation. And I'll draw your attention to the screen on the far right, your far right, not mine. One of the challenges that always comes up in this type of research is that individuals are inherently skeptical about meaningful control because they don't have it today. They're not actually able to overcome that sort of cognitive barrier that, hey, this is possible because organizations don't give me meaningful control today. And so <laughs> when they're engaging with one of these products or services and they have the ability to, to revoke consent, and consent means something rather specific. This comes from a UK example. Um, in this context, we're talking about GDPR consent, PSD2 consent, the Payment Services Directive 2 consent is different. Complicated, right? But what this does is this uses an interaction design pattern to increase confidence in the unknown, increase trust. That the organization has actually done what they've said they've done, because they might not have the ability to cryptographically, at that point in time, in real time, verify that they've deleted the data, right? Because if you're in a financial services context and someone revokes consent, right, you may then have to remove that data from an operational database and ensure that it's still available in another database that's only accessible for auditing purposes, right? How do you communicate that in like two seconds? It's hard, right? So we utilize an interaction design pattern that visually represents the web of data that, that that individual has shared with the organization. And then the particular data point, grouping, attributes, et cetera, that the individual has chosen to revoke consent to starts off at 100% opacity, meaning it's that, that, that um, royalish blue, and it decreases in opacity until it disappears. And then there's a success notification. This type of stuff seems simple. We use these interaction design patterns in a variety of different contexts, but we very infrequently apply them to data sharing. Over the last 30 months, Data Trust by Design has had a significant impact on the consumer experiences that it's been applied to. We have a series of consumer outcome-focused metrics that are qualitative and quantitative across attitudinal and behavioral dimensions, and three of which that stand out most, that are quite often prioritized in these programs of work, are, uh, comprehension, 
time to comprehension, and propensity to willingly share. Across the board, we've increased comprehension by 60%. Now, if you look at baseline today, you're kind of like, it's not that meaningful. But we've also decreased time to comprehension by an order of magnitude. So people are more informed and more capable of making active choices faster than they've ever been able to make them before about the information they're being asked to share. And going back to this idea, this core thesis that Greater Than X was founded on, we've managed to showcase uplift of propensity to willingly share by eight times on average. Imagine gaining access to eight times the access to your customers that your competitors had. What would that do to your business? Let's talk really quickly about how this toolkit was applied to recent research that we conducted with the data standards body here in Australia. Our focus was consent management and revocation. I recognize the current CDR implementation has a variety of different constraints and limitations. I'm not going to get into that today. But what I would like to talk about is the explicit focus that we had to understand the progress-making forces and progress-hindering forces that might encourage or discourage individuals from actively managing and revoking consent, and the ways in which those individuals might go about achieving that. Now, the current CDR implementation relies upon a, a dual holder and dual dashboard model. Now, think about it like this, right? Like, it, it's crazy, the math doesn't add up, it doesn't scale, but, but let, me, let me demonstrate this. Let's say you're, you're a consumer, we all are, great, we can, we can empathize with that. Let's say you have 30 digital relationships, which is super on the low end of the estimates, right? Recent estimates are around mo most people in, in countries like Australia, the UK, US, etc., have about 200 or more online relationships, right? So let's just go on the low end, 30. I've got 60 dashboards. I want to control my data meaningfully. Where do I go? Which one? The 60. Right? Kind of sounds like a nightmare. It's not particularly consumer-centric. Doesn't seem like the consumer data right. When we tested that model, the progress hindering forces far outweighed the progress making forces. No switch, no behavior change. People will not actively control their data. It is too hard. The transaction costs are too high. What happens if we be a little bit more ambitious and we rely on a different, inherently consumer-centric model, a centrally accessible, not centralized, centrally accessible consent management and revocation dashboard, just like a personal information management service. The progress-making forces far outweigh the progress-hindering forces. The switch is likely to occur. OK, let's do some work. It's only going to take three minutes. It's not going to take too long, I promise. So if everyone can get out, or everyone that has it, get out the Curious Thinkers app, go to Thursday the 24th, Data Trust by Design with Nathan Kinch, scroll to the bottom, you're going to see surveys. Click on that. There are three questions that I would like you to answer. Please do this independently, without talking. No collaboration or cooperation. Simple questions. We're going to spend about two and a half minutes on this. What are your biggest data ethics and data trust challenges or opportunities? I'm going to start the timer now, and I'll leave you in awkward silence for about two, two and a half minutes. All right, everybody, we'll stop there. If I can garner your attention for about 90 more seconds, we'll, uh, we'll go to Q&A. Does anyone feel somewhat discombobulated? <laughs> oh, that's an insider joke. Or was that easy? Was it easy to define? What was challenging? What was an opportunity? The purpose of that was to start putting pen to paper, figuratively, not literally, and start a discussion that I hope we can all continue when we go and enjoy the beautiful view in just a moment. Before I leave, I'd like to ask and leave you with a few questions uh, and then propose some very specific tactical things that you can do over the next few days to maintain rather than lose momentum. The high-level question that I'd like to ask is, how is ethics 
specifically data ethics perhaps, privacy and trust becoming core to your organizational strategy. Who's responsible for it? How do you measure it? How are these things operationalized? These are challenging questions. What specific activities are you currently engaging in to help you earn access, earn access to more of the right customer data? And lastly, how are you thinking about this transition away from financial services as a vertical towards lifestyle services, the types of lifestyle services that Louise was articulating as a horizontal? So what can you do today? Read this report. Document your ideas. It's been designed in such a way that it should encourage collaboration, that it should encourage shared ideas to be developed. Once you've done that, take small actions quickly. This stuff is huge, but we've got to execute tactically. We need visibility of tangible progress so that we can sustain our motivation. And if you can communicate that, you can help inspire others. The reason I'm on this stage today is because we fundamentally believe that the CDR is an opportunity to empower individuals with meaningful control and foster innovation and competition as a result. By working together, by collaborating and progressing towards a cooperative model, we believe that the vision that we have articulated for 2030, or something thereabouts, can become our shared reality. Thank you so much, Nathan, Monique, the crew at Cuscal. Thank you for having us here today. We look forward to continuing this discussion going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Give him a round of applause. Louise, pop up here as well. Uh, we've been absolutely deluged with questions. We won't get through all of them, but when we go to morning tea, I'm sure you guys will be there to chat on these subjects. Nathan, quickly, where are people at with data? Because you hear both ends of the spectrum. One is that people just give away their data for nothing. They just don't care. The other end is one breach of my privacy and I'll never deal with an organisation ever again because I've been abused because my data's got out there. Where are individuals at? A lot of these questions focus on the individual. Where are individuals at with data? So it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, it, th there's this concept known as the privacy paradox and it basically proposes that attitudinally people care about their privacy uh, even if they don't necessarily understand what it means. Uh, and, and behaviourally, they don't. They share their data for free Wi-Fi at Starbucks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And terrible coffee, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate. That's why Starbucks doesn't work here in Australia. Um, mm. Recent research has really challenged that, particularly in um, 2015, Chicago Booth uh, delivered um, a, a, bo a body of evidence that they've called the trade-off fallacy. And what it proposes um, is that basically industry is trying to justify that individuals are making um, active trade-off decisions and they're happy about it. And when you dive much deeper into the literature, it doesn't seem to be that way. People feel disempowered and disenfranchised. It's like there's been this war for their data and they've lost it, so they've given up. They're apathetic. Um, we did some recent research with the Consumer Policy Research Centre and it dives into the mental model that individuals have quite specifically. It's called a day in the life of data. Definitely worth referencing on that. Louise, someone asked a similar question. How do we assess consumer comprehension of terms and conditions in order to iterate, refine and evolve enhanced agency? Because it's the old, the old T's and C's again, isn't it? Just click them. Don't, I don't, it would take the rest of my life to even read them. Just kick them. Where are people at with T's and C's? And do they have a role to play here? Um. So one of the really interesting things that you can do with the kind of technology I was describing is you can understand at an accelerated rate what your words and the images and the diagrams that you're using are really saying to people. Um, and you can, you can pre-test any kind of communication or customer journey or the language that you're using to drive people through that relationship with you to understand what's coming through with that and therefore to refine your language, to refine your how you're communicating with people, to get to a point where it is actually uh, not just uh, legally acceptable, not just appropriate, uh, but actually speaking to people in a language that they understand. And you're constantly testing whether or not they've understood that. So uh, people use uh, the technology that Signal have built to test uh, whether they're, um, the language that they're using, the messaging that they're constructing in any context is um, actually A, saying what we want to be saying and B, saying it in a way which is understood by those that we want to receive it. 
so it's just a, this, uh, mecha, uh, just a just test, 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 but you're testing in a way which works uh, at scale. So some organizations, for example, have used that technology to understand what is it we as an organization want to be saying? Are we actually saying that? So you just ingest your website, all of your reports, all of your marketing, all of your communication, all of your advertising, all of your social media, all of your T's and C's, uh, all of the communications you have with people, and then you compare, are we saying what we think we're saying? Are we really saying that? And then if you really want to get um, gritty about it, you compare the first set with the second set with how are we received and understood by our audiences. And typically there's a gap between what you think you're saying and what you're actually saying. And there's a massive gap between what you're actually saying and what people are saying back to you. So being able to interpret uh, that unstructured data in those three phases is uh, very illuminating for people. Nathan, what can people do collectively about their data? As individuals or organisations or both. both? So as organisations, I think we need to transition the way that we think about some of this stuff. Like, it's broadly acceptable that boards are responsible for corporate governance, set strategy, identify, manage risk. We now operate information businesses. Boards should be responsible mm -hmm. for information governance, set ambitious information strategy, effectively identify and mitigate information risk. If you critically analyse the board composition of, say, the ASX 100, you will observe a skills and experiences gap. These organisations are not adept at information governance mm -hmm. right at the top. I think that's actually really critical because you then create the authorising environment for this stuff to be operationalised by a variety of different talented people. Uh, as individuals, there are a variety of different things uh, that we can do. We can utilise privacy enhancing technologies, many of which are improving rapidly. Um, one of the other things that we can do is just pause very quickly and reflect on the product or service that we're being asked to sign up to mm -hmm. and the potential positive and, co uh, and negative consequences of doing so. Um, and by doing that and becoming thoughtful and mindful about that experience, mm -hmm. uh, what we observe consistently is that individuals start transitioning towards behaviours that are more uh, uh, closely aligned yeah. to, to trustworthiness mm -hmm. um, and will start taking actions mm -hmm. to uh, protect themselves if the organisations they have entrusted aren't doing it for them. Yeah. You've got a couple of noisy nods out of Louise there, I yes. noticed yes. you agree. Quick yes. question, Louise. Your poll answers seem to suggest about 80-20. 80, 20. 80 still old way, 20 the new way. Mm -hmm. Did that surprise you? Was that about what you expected? And what's the real power of the, the Signoi platform? What, is it, what does it do with the data that, that takes it to the next level? Okay, um, so it didn't surprise me at all. Um, that was kind of what I was expecting. But the point of that was for you to have a personal moment with yourselves that you go, actually, how am I building my business? Am I really on the dominant codes, the codes which are, are strong right now but are, will decline over time? And what do I need to do to change who, I, who and what I am as an organisation, how I interact with my customers? Um, you asked me um, how Signoy's platform is being deployed. Um, one customer uh, described it to me um, as, as electricity. You know, it can do lots of different things. It's just how do I want to apply it um, in, in to, 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 to understand either the cultural weather that I'm swimming in uh, or the category that I'm uh, in, you know, if you're a financial services business and you're in the mortgages category, that's an example of a category. The neighbourhood I'm in, who are my competitors? And that point about my, who am I? Um, and, and how am I received? Um, one other customer had a really interesting feedback for us. This was a technology services firm uh, that wanted to better understand one of their customers. Um, and it was worth a, a significant amount of money for them. It was worth, if they, they were just about to pitch some business, it was worth between 250 and 500 million US dollars to win this piece of business. And they said, we want to understand this customer better. So they asked us to deploy every single module and every single metric in the platform. They said to us, we want to understand everything this customer is saying about themselves through any mechanism 
text, images, whatever, through any distribution mechanism. We want to understand what everyone is saying back to them. We want to understand all of their competitors, 30 competitors from Amazon to Marks and Spencers in the homewares category in today's cultural weather. Synthesizing you know, the millions of data points which are available on that down to a coherent a uh, tight set of uh, just, under, uh, just over 527,000 data items, uh, interpreting that data and giving them the readout on everything this particular uh, retailer was getting wrong, things they needed to fix in their brand, in their marketing, in their messaging, in their services, in their uh, returns, which are very broken, by the way, uh, in, their, in the way that they spoke to their customers, um, took six man days from beginning to end. And the customer said two interesting things to us. They said, one, you know John Lewis better than we do, and we've worked with them for 10 years. Two, is this witchcraft? I'm like, <laughs> I am your witch. <laughs> one quite quick question to wrap it up. Um, Nathan, how can banks, and you talk about if you don't have the, the board level knowledge, how can banks make this model a sustainable part of doing business and not just something done mm -mm -mm. as part of a project? Mm. Yeah, look, it's a, uh, I, d I don't actually think it's a simple question. I, I don't want to be reductionist and I don't mm. want to answer it simply, but let me give you sort of like a, a, a framework. <coughs> Organisations need to commit to transformation um, and transformation takes time. That requires bold and courageous leadership. It requires a commitment to ask and answer the hard mm. decisions. It might mean getting rid of people that aren't the right fit, um, mm. hiring people who are the right fit, and building capability so that this stuff literally becomes part of their everyday DNA. Um, and then, like something that's, that's quite tactical, but still takes time to operationalize, is just shifting the measures of progress. Yeah. What is it that you value? How do you go about figuring out how to measure it? And then how do you determine if you're making progress towards those, those values and outcomes that, that you have defined? Um, there are a heap of things that fall off the back of that, but at a very high level, that's probably how I'd describe it. Fantastic. Please give them a big round of applause, Louise and Nathan. <laughs> Wonderful.